Good morning. We continue in the Gospel of Luke this morning as we ask the question that the disciples first asked about Jesus. Who then is this? It's a question that has a profound implication for your life and eternity and my own. So let's look at God's word, Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. We'll read and then we'll pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst, in the, to the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with the awe and saying, we have, been, we have seen extraordinary things today. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your son. And as we meet him in your word, we pray uh, that it would do a work that is eternal and good and powerful in our lives, a work that we know our hearts need. Uh, and so, Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would meet us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't have to live long before you have an experience of expecting one thing and getting something entirely different. You can go a whole week anticipating that you made the soccer team in school or the school play. You believe you got the job. That's just a matter of time before you find out. Or that girl, she'll say yes to the next date. But then you walk into the meeting, and instead they let you know that you made the B team, that you're the understudy, that you aren't qualified for the job. Or sorry, it's not you, it's me. Luke 5 tells us about a paralyzed man who was anticipating his encounter with Jesus to be healed. And instead, he gets forgiven. Jesus once said of God that he is not a bad father who gives his children a stone when they ask for bread or a snake when they ask for an egg. But here this man is brought to Jesus for one reason to find healing for his unmoving body. And Jesus turns away and pronounces a very different kind of healing. You can imagine the disappointment among his friends. After all, these guys had heard of Jesus, that he was in town with this unheard of power to heal. And they must think, this is it. This is the cure for our dear friend. And of course, he can't get up and go himself. And so his friends take him carry him. And even as they arrive at the home where Jesus is, the crowd was so great they can't bring him in to line before Jesus. And so even at that moment, they don't stop. They begin to break and enter the home, opening up the, the roof tiles so they can drop their friend down in this last-ditch effort for healing. Who wouldn't want friends like this? Such great faith that they show. And yet as we read, we can see something is off. The most impressive part of this real-life incident is that when Jesus notices the faith of these desperate men, his friends, he turns to this man. Instead of seeing his malady, Jesus seems to look more deeply. And all of a sudden, with everyone in the house looking on, this healer, doesn't heal. Instead, this preacher speaks. And we think, how unhelpful. 
Jesus delivers a word that no one expected to hear. Man, your sins are forgiven. It's a troubling moment for these friends who would have worked so hard and Jesus doesn't come through. I mean, they called the ambulance, they, they got the stretcher, they took him to his hospital bed, and he's in need of desperate treatment. And in comes the expert surgeon who says, well, I hope you feel better. Here's a balloon and a card. It seems even worse than that, though, because this heart surgeon preacher doesn't even address this man as sick, but as a sinner. He's told that above and beyond his lifeless legs, that have wrecked his life, what is first to be dealt with, what really needs to be addressed, is his unseen life, his crippling guilt of sin before a holy God. See, this encounter uh, that you see here in this text is given to us actually three times in the four Gospels. And the reason is clearly so that we won't miss how central this moment is to understanding Jesus. In fact, for you to really know Jesus personally this morning, it is important for you to place yourself in this house with Jesus this morning. To really get Jesus, you too must feel your own expectations for what you think you want from God and this world. And then strangely, to find those very expectations go unmet in the light of Jesus, the healer who doesn't give you what you want. I know if we are honest that 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 can be extremely difficult to come to terms with. What are you asking for these days? What are you even praying for? What is your focus? I could take a few guesses from my own far too often personal experience that on average, we give thanks for the circumstances of life, how things are going, and we we often give thanks for, for how things are going well. On the flip side, we lie in bed at night and stress out when they are not going so well. We seek things like a bit better career, a bigger place to live, better health, a bit more free time, and enjoyment. We focus on what could be better relationships, fun friendships, satisfaction in our successes, a bit more peace of mind in our finances. What is the ideal life in our mind? Isn't it just an easier one? We want to wake up and feel great about our day. And so our often silent or not so silent prayer is, Lord, thanks that life is easy right now. Or, Lord, can't you make things more easy? And so you see that here you are in this house with Jesus. Whether we are talking to him or not, here Jesus is with power to heal. What do you want him to do? And now hear Jesus' words of forgiveness. His word of your sins are forgiven. Is that on the list? How high up is it on your list? And so to our worldwide surprise, Jesus wants to strike your heart today with this truth, that he has not come to help you dress up your wardrobe, renovate your goals, and rebuild your house while it sits in this floodplain of unforgiven sin and it's raining. As much as we want to hear the momentary healing words of Jesus on any aspect of our life, we find here that Jesus comes with a better word. And that is what is so absolutely surprising. Because it's not what we are looking for. See, these friends of the paralytic would be shocked by Jesus' words, but there's another group of people in the room that were also shocked. When Jesus declares your sins are forgiven, the minds of many of the watching religious leaders come alive, and we are told that they have traveled from near and far, from, from 
Judea and Galilee and even the great city of Jerusalem to listen to Jesus for themselves. But at this personal pronouncement of another man's forgiveness, we hear this silent car crash of conflicting thoughts happen. In verse 21 it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So there's that question again. The theme of our whole series in the Gospel of Luke, who is this? It's this right question to ask. But we can see here that something's not quite right about the motives behind who asks, who asks it. It's the same confusion of these troubled friends of this yet unhealed paralytic. The Pharisees and the scribes were leaning in to Jesus. They were listening into his words. They were trying to grasp his ministry. But at the mention of this greater message, this word, your sins are forgiven. That's it. They're out. Why? Because they hear this man commit blasphemy. He is taking God's place. How is that? Well, we know we hear about forgiveness a lot in the Bible, actually. People ask for it in the Bible. They desire it for themselves. They even desire it for others. Prophets in the Bible often offer forgiveness as they re- people would call people to return to God in faith and repentance. Such words are like those in Isaiah 55 where it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the, righteous man, his th- the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon It's one thing to be called to return to the Lord so he may pardon. It's another thing altogether to stand before someone and say, I actually can declare that pardon. See, the teachers are right. This is something that only God can say. And at this moment, I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus is not surprised by this incident. He's not struck by what people say of him here. I believe Jesus is revealing what he must, so not to confuse him. As we read through the historic gospel accounts, we find Jesus is quite unwilling to settle for what many of our friends think of him today. He is not just one kind and wise teacher, one ancient miracle worker. Jesus isn't satisfied with being labeled just a mysterious leader with some unpronounced purpose over his life. Jesus makes it clear here to this man, to the investigating religious leaders who were there, and to you today, why he came. Not to heal men, whether they were paralyzed or possessed. He came as God in the flesh to save sinners from their unforgiven status with God. And yet we find in this passage a response that we can also see in our own hearts. Having Jesus say, I forgive, does not make anyone more ready to hear the news. As a pastor here in Victoria, with about, let's say, 2 to 4% of of people who go to church in our city, I get it that not many are leaping at the offer of Jesus this morning. And one reason this is the case is because of what I've said before, that being forgiven is not what we are often looking for. The problem of unforgiveness of our sins is not seen as the most paramount issue worth solving above climate change or world peace or global poverty. The forgiveness of sins. We're not sure where that fits. Now maybe many Uh, of us, maybe you today, can admit that sin in our world exists. That people are often bad. Even admitting, yeah, at times I can be a rather terrible person. But the problem is, we just go on. We live with it. We keep going as if sin can never be dealt with by God's true justice and wrath or by his grace 
and mercy. And so we don't think being forever forgiven by this God is an option. Consider for a moment with me today what this unbelief in forgiveness does inside of us. It surely doesn't mean we we stop sinning or get better. In fact, it's the opposite. Living in a world of no true God-given forgiveness means we must go on dealing with our sins on our own. We deal with our constant moral failures, our motivational faults, and countless lacks of love in some other way. Let me list two common ways for us this morning how we tend to deal with our own sins on our own. The first is that we can try to forget about them. This week I was sitting in the living room with my kids and trying to remember, as they, they did, they tried to remember all of their grade school and, and high school teachers' names. I'm not sure why, but as the kids named teacher after teacher from kindergarten to, to their times today, I was impressed that even my wife Linnea could recall lots of the names of teachers she had in high school. But as they did this, I noticed I couldn't remember a single one. I guess that is how much I I I like school or how terrible my memory is. But sometimes that we are like that with our sin. The, The things we have done wrong, the experiences of our life that didn't go well, the evil that has given was given birth by us into this world, it isn't forgiven. It's just a little forgotten. We move on. We fight to get past the pain, the hurt we cause, and we forget its lasting effects. And the more we walk away, the more distance we take from ourselves and the justice that sin deserves. Time doesn't really repair all the the things that go wrong that we do. It doesn't deal with what we did. It just leaves things a mess for others to deal with. But just as some of us can remember the, the names of our past teachers, Eventually, we remember that in God's economy, the mess can't be forgotten altogether. The second way that we deal with sin in a world of unforgiveness is by minimizing it. You hurt me, and I hurt you, but let's just not worry about it. It wasn't so bad. I've seen worse. I know I didn't keep my word, but I had pretty good intentions. I know that I have got this thing with lust, but it's just a private thing. Yes, I shouldn't speak that way to my wife or my husband, but they really deserved it. It's not really gossip. I'm just decompressing after a hectic day. And so it goes. It's not a big deal. Time after time, God-centered, holy, humble repentance is short-circuited. Now I can say all of this knowing that you can still hear these words today, I forgive you, from a lot of places. The phrase is not foreign to a world outside of Jesus. Thankfully, God's common grace is alive and well so that we use these words at times with our spouses and our children, people who hurt us. We love them, and we need to hear them. But the point of this incredible moment is that none of us can say them like this. Like God. Behold, your sins really are forgiven. No one has said them this way. That is until Jesus says them. And that's the point. How can he? Well, Jesus says how. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk. Here Jesus points out why he has all of this show of power. All his words to heal are but proof that the Son of Man has been given this greater word to say. Verse 24 but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose. 
Previously, it was thought that only God in heaven, at the end of the story of your life, had the authority to forgive. You may be thinking that, that it's a grand mystery of your life who God will actually forgive. You don't really know. And yet the surprise here is that we see right now the divine authority of forgiveness is here found on earth in the middle of the story of life, in the incarnate Son of God, proving his word to us as this paralyzed man now stands. Listen, I I think you know our world isn't good. I think you know that it hurts. I think you know that we are a part of that hurt. We strain relationships. We live with short-lived love for people. We break our promises. We all could have the label that says over us, Scott, unmet expectations. That isn't new. This could be the first sermon that you hear, but you don't really need me to tell you that you are a sinful person. Just looking at your wedding vows or your parental promises or your own job description for work or last year's virtue signal post that you put on social media, we can all just admit we can't even meet the standards we set for ourselves, much less God's. We are not what we are meant to be. We are not what we could be. We are far less than what we should be. We are a mess. Can you see? that outside of Jesus, we've had to just settle. Thinking as bad as we are, we're going to have to just make do. Never to hear a better word than keep trying. Keep trying to make uh, your big mess of yesterday not as big today. And so we live as if we'll never be rid of this growing amount of guilt in us. Friends, we have a greater and more fabulous good news to hear. God came and he looked upon this man with the authority to speak to him in the same way that he can speak to you right now and say your sins are forgiven. Jesus says, I have authority to forgive sins by saying, stand, rise, walk. And the crowd saw this and they they immediately glorified God. But today, we have an even greater proof to see and to believe in his forgiving authority. Jesus, our true friend of sinners, reveals that he has come for us and would not stop, just like the friends of the paralyzed man would not stop, but he made a way And instead of lying that friend down, Jesus himself was laid down before us. Jesus came that he may be laid down on the cross and placed in a tomb of death for our sins and what we deserve. And yet in the authority of his perfect, sinless, obedient life, it was impossible for that death to hold him. And so he rose and now stands in heaven to pronounce this word to you, that your sin is defeated. The Apostle Paul defended the resurrection of Jesus as he said uh, the words in Corinthians that a Christian should be most pitied if Jesus had not risen from the dead, for he, we are still in our sins. But the opposite that of that is true then, that if Christ is risen, then we who believe in Jesus, and if you will this morning, and so I plead with you today as a as a friend, as a preacher, as a fellow sinner, that you will as well believe in Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, as the forgiver of your life, that you may be privileged to know that you are no longer under the guilt of your sin. Your sins are forgiven. And such news liberates us for eternity, and it opens our life anew today. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, you may be saying yes and amen to this. I needed Jesus' forgiveness more than anything else in my life that I thought I wanted. But let me ask you, does this show up? Does this news of the forgiveness of God upon your life bleed through your life? That you may glorify God and bring others to God as, as those friends brought their paralyzed man to Jesus. Would, would you bring your friends and coworkers with words and, and heart and desire to Jesus as well that they might hear this news? Do you find yourself denying yourself and taking up your humble cross in this life in light of all that you've received in the forgiveness of Jesus? Has this good news, though, become old news? in your heart. See, the crowd was surprised when Jesus said the words, you are forgiven. But the more surprising thing today is that we who have received Christ's forgiving words now so often do not live in light of those words. How often we are guilty of going back to living again as if we are not forgiven. As if we have to earn our way back to God. Or earn our place before others. When our place is actually secure. As a son and daughter. Through the mercies of Jesus Christ. Are you back to living as if you, you have no access to this lasting forgiveness? Do you find yourself defending yourself rather than repenting of yourself? Do you find yourself faking the fruits of the spirit that you wish you had? rather than just admitting the dryness of faith and your need of grace? Are you hiding your failures rather than unveiling them in the light of God's mercy in Jesus? Are you exaggerating other people's faults and blaming others rather than seeing today's sin in your life as a way that it reveals your deep need of continual grace from Jesus that has already been given? Church, how often we have the good news of God's eternal forgiveness and in the person of Jesus to know and to hear these words afresh. You are forgiven. But accepting these words deep into our hearts takes a lifetime. Think of the beauty that is ahead of us as we will accept these words more and more. See, God's forgiveness can turn every criticism you hear into the wounds of a friend. Knowing you're forgiven makes the stripping away of our pride become the loving discipline of a gracious father. The awareness of our faults is the doorway of a greater comfort from our Savior. As we can say, wow, that's the real me. I noticed today some terrible things about my heart, my life, my soul. And that is what I've been saved from. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Indeed, the power of the church is that we are a forgiven people in an unforgiven world. And so church, let us, like the paralytic, stand. And stand in the words of Jesus. You are forgiven. We continue in the Gospel of Luke this morning because we know we need Jesus this morning. We need his heart. We need his forgiveness. We need to continue to hear these words more deeply pressed upon us. And so let's hear them afresh. You are forgiven. Jesus, we thank you that in Christ we have the forgiveness of our sins. I pray that you would be with our hearts this morning, that you would turn them, that you would move them to say yes to you, to accept what you have for us, that we respond with, with a thankfulness, that we respond with joy. There might be a lot of things that we thought we wanted from you, but nothing compares to what 
we need from you, this forgiving word. And so we pray that you would help us to live in light of it all the more, to be willing to bring others to this word that they might hear from you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.